Okay, so I'd like to announce our next uh, keynote speaker, uh, Sebastian Schneewitz, um, and he's going to talk to us about healthcare databases and evidence on the effectiveness of medical products. Sebastian. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. So um, I will really show you an application of the data that, that we all work with. And I'm trying to bring what Zach and what David were saying to a soft landing, at least in a very narrow application, uh, which is, oh, can you hear me this way better? Okay, so I really have to uh, bend down here a little bit. All righty. Um, and um, it is a very specific application, which is around medical products and um, high stakes decision making around medical product that is with regard to regulators, FDA or European medicines agency deciding on whether they want to market um, uh, allow marketing authorization for medications, also for payer organizations and, and health technology assessment organizations, um, whether they want to cover such medications. Um, this is funded by FDA and other three or four letter agencies around DC of a conflict of interest with regard to Edion, a software company in this space. Now in the United States, we had the 21st Century Cures Act uh, of 2016, uh, and that um, legislation with tons of interesting stuff in there, but what's relevant for us um, as a division for pharmacoepidemiology was the fact that they asked the FDA to come up with a guidance for industry by 2021 that decides how they want to deal with real world evidence. Um, and what we are all doing is all real world data and real world evidence, whether you like the term or not, that's um, the term that FDA, what that 21st Century Cures Act is using here. Um, and uh, by the end of last year, they came up with this framework document, real world evidence framework document, where they laid out the pathway, so they have three or two and a half more years really, in order to come up with the guidance of how to integrate this um, uh, real world data into real world evidence. And real world data um, is defined in that document by FDA uh, as data um, generated during the routine operation of a healthcare system, right? So the data exactly that, that you are working with day in, day out. And real world evidence is then basically the analysis of such data uh, that lends itself to causal conclusions about the effectiveness and safety of medical products, okay? So uh, this is just to get all on the same um, uh, playing field here. Uh, this is a transactional database. It grows over time from the left to the right. It's only growing uh, and new information comes in daily and it's getting immediately sorted by the service date into this database. Each line uh, identifies a patient as contributing to the system. This is either insurance data that I mostly work with. Uh, there's a defined en enrollment date and the disenrollment date in each audit is not quite as clear often um, when you enter, when you contribute, when you stop contributing. Uh, we usually stabilize the data before we analyze them for reproducibility reasons. I've worked on dynamic data as well, where you run a query on Monday and run a, the same query on Tuesday, you get very different findings. That makes FDA very, very nervous. And then we, when we zoom in on each of these little spaghettis, right, this is a timeline for one patient, we then see all the encounters with the professional healthcare system. And that is enormously valuable information for the stuff that I'm doing uh, when it comes to causal analysis with regard to drug effects, right? The most reliable data field in these types of data, um, I was told and myself confirmed it to some extent, uh, is the date of service. And the date of service is actually quite helpful when you think about causal inference, where something has to come before another thing, right? Uh, and not the other way around. The cause has to come before the effect uh, um, in order to establish causality. And then, of course, we establish epidemiologic study designs in these types of data where we have a follow-up period, where we have a covert assessment period, we have a court entry date and all that, the typical terminology of an epidemiologist, okay? This is my world that I'm working in. The, when I do studies, it's always kind of the same um, uh, workflow. Is, the, is it better this way? Okay, I have to eat the microphone. <laughs> Uh, it's the same workflow uh, where we have a design layer where we think about what's the study design, is it a comparative study, is it a self-controlled study, uh, is it a scanning approach, we have bias reduction technologies with regard to study designs, and then comes this measures layer, and I think you are quite mm -hmm. active in that space, where in the end, what we need to know, we need to know the exposure status, we need to know 
the outcome that um, came from the exposure. Uh, we need to know information on the confounding variables, the, the disease state of the patients, and we need to identify the target population, right? Once this is characterized, we are ready to roll, right? But how do we get all this information from this massive amount of, of, of data that is out there? How can we bundle that? And of course, we need longitudinal record processing, because this is all longitudinal, right? In order to establish cause and effect, we need to have temporality built in. All this machine learning, natural language processing, but Right. It's all happening somewhere in there, right? Uh, and it's an enormous effort uh, and enterprise uh, that has gaming steam uh, over the last um, uh, years. Uh, and then comes the analytic layer. Again, we think we understand this very well, uh, what we can and can't do with these types of data. We need to achieve balance between the treatment groups that we compare, like in a randomized trial, but without randomization here. Uh, and we have a whole bunch of robustness checks uh, that whatever we find, uh, we can convince ourselves or our um, decision makers that, yes, it's, uh, it's probably a valid finding uh, within uh, some some um, range. The typical use cases that regulators have in mind are uh, real world evidence for um, approval decisions. Uh, and that is kind of bizarre a little bit because real world evidence can only be generated when the medication is in the marketplace. But these are uh, historical control groups for uh, single arm trials uh, that um, are used in 25% you know, of new drug applications oncology space, for example. Um, this is the key use case that FDA has in mind in this um, framework document. The European Medicines Agency is also very much aligned with this. On paper, they're further ahead. Uh, in reality, maybe a little bit behind, um, uh, but they, they follow each other very closely. So the medication is in the marketplace. It is approved. Uh, you collect information on the medication, its outcomes, and you want to have a, a, a supplemental um, indication um, a, a, for a different endpoint, for a different population. Uh, and can we use non-randomized real-world data in order to get such supplemental indications is the big question for, for FDA. Uh, then we have the accelerated pathways or adaptive pathways in Europe, uh, where you have uh, initial approval a bit earlier with uh, less evidence really, the strength of the evidence is slightly less, but you have to come back, it's a conditional approval, you have to come back with more data, and by definition, uh, they want to see real world evidence in order to give you the full approval. Um, and then, of course, we have the safety use cases. We have been doing this for the last 30 years uh, this, in the safety space, and we are quite established there, where uh, at the time of approval, there are signals uh, where uh, the regulators um, require in post marketing requirements the manufacturer to um, come up with the studies in order to uh, either refute that signal or expand on the signal or signals pop up out of the blue. Uh, all of a sudden, there's a signal for liver failure, and uh, you need to work that up um, expeditiously, uh, yet scientifically rigorously. Okay, so these are the kind of the key use cases uh, that uh, that we have in mind. So now comes the selection of use cases, and they're all happy use cases. And believe me, there are plenty unhappy use cases, right? Uh, and some of these use cases involve myself because um, I'm a slow reader of other people's work, but also because I can tell you the backstory if you if you wanted to know a little bit more. Uh, so this is. Um, on the left side, we uh, were involved in studying a protein. This is a drug that surgeons, cardiac surgeons, love because it stops bleeding and they cut a bit too much. Uh, and uh, But it can overdo it, the antifibrinolytic effect, uh, and we observed this increase in mortality uh, during the ho index hospital stay, a 78% increase in, in dying. Uh, this was presented to the FDA uh, twice, actually, uh, in an advisory committee meeting. The FDA and the advisors did not act on that knowledge because they felt uncomfortable. This is real world evidence. This is not a randomized trial. What do we do with this? Um, now, two months later, and this happens only once in your career, uh, the, a protein in arm of the BART trial in Canada funded by the Canadian government was stopped because of excess mortality. Right? Uh, and their point is 1.53 to 53% increase over 30 days. We had a 78% over, over seven days. Uh, so very much confirming. And then the regulators uh, jumped into action immediately, right? So that's, I'm not blaming them, don't get me wrong. It's just how confident are we to make substantial decisions that have implications for patients, real life, right? Based on real world evidence, based on non-randomized uh, um, healthcare database uh, uh, information. Another example, tocilizumab, uh, it's, a, it's a DMARD used for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, a, a, the phase three trial showed uh, an increased uh, lipid level, 
serum lipid level. And the concern by the regulators was that this might cause coronary events, um, heart attacks uh, and other things uh, in that space. Um, and they required a post-marketing uh, requirement. Mm -hmm. And uh, Genentech at that point started the Intractive trial on the right side. Uh, but they also um, worked with us to do a multi-database study. We conducted a database study. We refuted that potential mm -hmm. signal uh, on the left side. And then uh, six months later, the trial was completed and found exactly the same a refutation um, of the uh, potential increased risk for cardiovascular events. Now, what you can also do is now switching over to dabigatran, which is an anticoagulant. Once you have atrial fibrillation, uh, you have increased risk for stroke. You do anticoagulation. You do this with warfarin or coumadin in Europe. Um, and uh, there was this real eye trial for marketing these. This one of the first of these products, dabigatran, a direct anticoagulant. And what you see here is. Um, it is, this green band is the 95% confidence interval of, of the RCT. This is, uh, it was marketed in October 2010. In June 2011, our first data cut that became available, the point estimate here is 1.10, but with a huge 95, right? Because reflecting the uncertainty, we are dealing with very few cases, very few strokes at this point. Makes decision makers very uncomfortable. The point estimate is above the null. It's a 10% increase if you take a little, right? They, it's hard for them to deal with the wide confidence intervals. Well, no problem, because the infrastructure is set up. Let's wait another six months until we get the next bunch of data. Now look at the point estimate. Now it's below the, the, the null, below the 1.0, and the 95s are getting closer together because now we have more events. It's event-driven analysis, right? Would you change your opinion now? Maybe not. Let's wait another six months. Another six months later, right, uh, we see this data point now where the 95, the upper uh, 95 interval uh, uh, boundary is now below the null finding, right? So at this point, we're actually very close to the RCT finding, very confident, basically saying um, the medication in routine care works as well as in the randomized trial, right? And this is enormously important for the regulators on the safety side, but also for the insurance companies, right? And this is then going on, and then you ask me, when do you stop, Sebastian? And I tell you, well, once the system is set up, it's almost for free to redo this, right? Uh, this is exactly what, what was done here, right? Again, these are all happy cases, use cases, and there are many unhappy use cases. This is an example on the left side where uh, plenotumumab, an MGen product, was um, a, received a supplemental indication for a treatment refractory ALL, um, where they had a single arm trial. They had no comparison group in the randomized trial. So it's not a randomized trial, but it's just a trial. Uh, and they use electronic health records in order to mimic the counterfactual experience uh, had these patients not been treated, right? So, uh, and um, the FDA went along with that, right? So this is the use case number one, pre-approval, uh, where real-world evidence can support this decision-making. And then uh, and a year later, the TOWER trial became available, kind of confirming uh, what the single-arm trial with the synthetic control arm uh, was showing um, and was used by the regulators, right? Again, a happy example. Um, I don't know, need to go into this. Uh, switching over to diabetes, um, where a colleague of mine, Elisabetta Patano, uh, motivated by the EMPA-REG outcome trial, showing that empaclifosin, one of the flosin antidiabetic medications, oral antidiabetic medications, showed a substantially reduced risk for heart failure hospitalization, antidiabetic heart failure. Nobody thought about that. Uh, the CANVAS trial for canaclifloan, kind of the sister molecule, was ongoing. We thought, why don't we just try to predict what the CANVAS trial will say? And we did this uh, on the left side and with a point as sort of 0 0.61, so 40% reduction of heart failure hospitalization. Quite striking. Um, and then the CANVAS trial was, was uh, revealed at the ADA meeting. Uh, we also presented at the ADA blinded towards the finding of CANVAS, and they find pretty much the same, right? Um, why did these database studies come to the same causal conclusions? And how confident, this is about confidence, how confident will we be that the next study that we embark on or that FDA wants to embark on or the EMA, right, or a manufacturer wants to embark on, will get it right? So that's the key question. It's not about trust. It is we are trusting God, right? This is about confidence. How much confidence do we have in the science? When we do a randomized trial, we have so much control over things. And if we don't screw up, we know what we get at the end, right? Um, it, with regard to validity, we don't know the finding. Um, 
so, so this is a, it's a key question. So it comes back to the question, why do we love randomized trials? Uh, clearly because of the random treatment assignment that helps balance the treatment groups and get rid of confounding. But equally important, um, the controlled outcome measurement, right? We are in charge of measuring what, when, and how. Right? We have total control over that. When we work with the data that we collect during the routine operation of healthcare system, we're relying on the physicians out there to record um, whatever they think is worth recording, right? Uh, and then it's easy to, a randomized trial is easy to understand. That's equally important, I think. My mother understands what a randomized trial is. Uh, and the decision makers in the agencies, whether it's HTA, whether that is FDA or EMA, um, none of these people have ever done a randomized trial. Nevertheless, they happily interpret a randomized trial and make massive decisions based on that, right? But they feel very uncomfortable with real world evidence. And that's not only about the lack of, of, of randomization, it is about the measurement issues. How well do we measure the outcomes? How well do we measure um, uh, treatment stratifiers? So we came up with, uh, together with the FDA, with a, with a laundry list of what, what to do and how to approach this, this um, problem. Uh, and there's certain um, study question dependent characteristics, uh, but they have an active comparator. We like this much better than have a, a, a non-user comparator, whether the outcome is measured. Of course, there's huge hope in electronic health records in our field, right? Um, with regard to measuring health status, with regard to measuring um, uh, functional status, cognitive status, pain. But then I look at the records of my rheumatologist. What does it say? Looks good, come back in six months. There's no hack score, nothing, right? So we have a long way to go, and we all know that. Um, but that doesn't discourage us because it's only getting better, not worse. We love this um, new user active comparator cohort study design because it mimics a randomized trial. On the left upper side, you see a randomized trial. R indicates randomization. You have a washout period. You get randomized to treatment or not treatment or two different treatments. We mimic that in our cohort design where we have a washout period and then we have selection going on. S for selection, right? We don't randomize. We observe. So it's selection into an exposed group and an unexposed group or comparator group, right? For a variety of reasons uh, that um, it results in better outcomes. An example here is where uh, we compared statins against non-use of statins with regard to all-cause mortality in elderly patients. These are Medicare data. And on the left side, you see all these boxes, right, nested into each other. Uh, and the largest box is all Medicare data. And the smallest box is our attempt to mimic a randomized trial in that population, that was the, oh, forgot the name of the trial, I have all these fancy names. Uh, it was a trial of primostatin in elderly patients, right? So um, and what you see on the right side is, um, on the x-axis, you see the different boxes. Um, from the left to the right, the boxes are getting smaller and smaller, more and more restriction. And on the y-axis, you see the hazard ratio for mortality, right? So this is our, the overall mortality. And what you see at the beginning, you see very biased point estimates. You see this on the left side? Do you see my arrow here? Okay, right. So highly biased. Um, and, and as you move on with more and more restriction, the point estimates that you're moving very much towards this red line, which is the randomized trial. And it's just because of restricting the population more and more uh, to, to the randomized trial population. There's no statistical adjustment. These are two by two tables, right? What you also see that the 95s are getting wider and wider because the boxes are getting smaller and smaller, right? All makes sense. What we see is the new user design as well as the active comparator is moving the needle quite a bit. These study design choices are extremely important to get to valid findings. Uh, so we have data dependencies about the data quality and fit for purpose is a key term that I heard in this conference as well already. Uh, then number five is very painful for me. And number five is perfectly avoidable mistakes that investigators do over and over again and they publish that over and over again uh, and we try to educate but apparently we're not successful here um, and um, immortal time bias um, adjusting for causal intermediates reverse causation you see papers reverse causation where the outcome comes first and the exposure comes second how can that be um, and why don't we see this in randomized trials? There's the temptation there that when all the data is collected for you already, that you do all sorts of um, interesting things. 
We see this very frequently. So Elisabetta and her team went through this painful work of um, looking at uh, 100 cohort studies and 55 case control studies, kind of trying to see whether these biases, these known and avoidable mistakes are observable. And in 66% of cohort studies, she found immortal person time, which often leads to bias, not always. Uh, and over adjusting by causal intermediates in 87% of case control studies. This is avoidable, right? Uh, and we want to do a better job. Uh, robust this check, we have a whole litany of tools there. There's also check for balance of unmeasured factors, right? How can you check the balance of unmeasured factors? Here's an example where, again, in the diabetes space, where we compared, uh, what was it here, linagliptin versus pyoglitazone, so two oral antidiabetics uh, in a large um, database study, in a claims database study in this case, where we adjusted 120 covariates by one-to-one -one propensity score matching, came up with these 8,000 patients in the end that were nicely matched. Among those 8,000 patients, 20% were linkable to electronic health records. And on the right side, you see a bunch of variables that we would love to know, but we don't see them in claims data. So we cannot balance on them with our technique, with our propensity score, but we would love to see whether we have achieved balance nevertheless. And here's the slide, the next slide, where in this subset of EHR data that are linked to claims, now we see that we have actually achieved nice balance in smoking status and obesity, in duration of diabetes, HbA1c, renal function, lipids, right? Nicely balanced, although we had not directly adjusted for that. So that's very comforting. We do this routinely now, uh, thanks to Sean Murphy and his wisdom, we have now linked the um, RPDR, the, the EHR data partners with claims data, where we can do this exercise routinely in order to check whether we have achieved balance in unmeasured factors. The barriers to use real world evidence by decision makers was a survey by Malone. Methods are too complex. I don't understand what the heck, Sebastian, you're doing. Methods not transparent, you're not telling us everything. No control for confounding, that's always in the back of your mind if you don't have randomization. Uh, lack of experience in conducting this. People have no experience with that and therefore they are uncomfortable with interpreting such findings in base massive decisions on that. And how do we do this, right? Uh, quality improvement measures, um, the, we all do one offline programming. Whenever we do a study that where we know it goes to regulators, to FDA or EMA, we do double programming. We have one protocol and two programmers. And these are very experienced programmers. They do this for 20, 30 years. And every time, every time we get two different findings. Right? because they read the protocol slightly differently. And that is a problem, right? We try to adjudicate then in the end, and I hope that we come to the right conclusion. Maybe both are wrong, who knows, right? Uh, so there's a massive quality issue here that we can remedy with software platforms where they, they are much more organized. Um, uh, they request the study parameters directly from the investigator rather than having this translation process with the protocol and the programmer, uh, and that reduces uh, these types of issues. Um, and then we have more uh, new transparency standards for these types of studies from the two professional societies, ESPI and ESPOR. So we're making good progress uh, in order to instill more confidence uh, that the decision makers need. Now, we talked about transparency, reproducibility. What about validity? What's the ultimate validity test that we can do? So we are approached by the FDA as part of this framework document that I mentioned at the very beginning um, to identify 30 randomized trials that the FDA had used for approval decisions for primary or secondary um, and try to repeat, repeat them with claims data and see whether we get the same findings uh, as, the, as the randomized trials. Uh, so we have developed a a process with the regulator. Regulators love processes. It's really mind boggling. Uh, they have a process now um, we, with certain points where we can abort the process and say, look, don't go any further with these database studies. You have to do primary data collection, you have to do a randomized trial. Um, but there's a whole bunch of things that go through the process. We have feasibility analysis. We look at balance that I have described to you. We register protocol, uh, and you see five of those uh, that are registered already. Um, we are in the process of doing as part of the 30. Um, we do this in this platform, and the platform can be shared with the FDA, so that FDA can now reanalyze the data. Because the alternative is, I, so I got audited twice by the FDA and everybody, every time was a nightmare, the whole thing, because they want to get the original data, right? And I can guarantee them already when they requested that you will get something differently because I know if I have two programmers from my own shop doing one protocol, they get two different findings. So it's guaranteed and it's always, it's a mess. 
this now they have a platform they can see the same data and they see the same code and they click the execute button and they get the same finding that's a good starting point for a conversation and then they can do sensitivity and they can change assumptions as much as they want that's all fine that's exactly what they want they want to understand the robustness and that is part of their job uh, but they have a better starting point now uh, rather than this uh, and then we check whether we we come to an agreement here um and then you know the fda people said well sebastian you do this for so many years if you know already what the trial result is you can pick the study parameters in a way that you will land where the randomized trial was landing right so i think they're overestimating my abilities here but uh, we, we then talked about if you give us a bit more money we can also do this prospectively so we agreed on another contract where we identify seven ongoing phase four post-marketing trials so a medication is in the marketplace we observe the utilization uh, and the patients using these medications and we predict the outcome of these trials right so the stakes are higher and you and you observe yourself if you have a little bit of introspection right you behave very differently now all of a sudden the stakes are much higher now right because you have you know, whatever reputation is left of myself you have to lose something now right so um you, you want to get it right so here's this example the first one out of the seven uh that was the comparison of lenagliptum against um, clomipiride one of the sulfonylureas again diabetes uh, we submitted the manuscript in December 2018. Uh, we presented the findings at the ADA, it was just last weekend in San Francisco. Uh, we, we saw no improvements, so 0.91, maybe a hint of a, a protective effect with regard to cardiovascular events, uh, but not really that much. Um, it's really a null finding. Uh, and uh, the Carolina folks, we knew, would pre so we presented on Friday, they were presenting on Monday after the weekend. What did they find? 0.98. Look, the 95s, 95s are nicely overlapping. I call this a success, right? And um, and, um, and this is the slide that the trialists put up on Monday. On the left side, you see real world prediction of Carolina, and then you see the Carolina findings uh, with regard to null finding cardiovascular and the protective effect with regard to hypoglycemia, which is well known. So. It is in my mind, and it goes back to, remember David's slide, there's one slide where he said, um, particularly in companies, you see this disconnect between senior management wanting to do a lot of data, science stuff, real world evidence, the disconnect to the people actually doing this, the people are doing this, they're saying, I, I stay with what I know because I know it works at least in the way it, it works, right? Um, we need to demonstrate here and there with use cases that this can work because otherwise we're not changing the world we're not changing how people see the world and this is why we do this calibration against randomized trials and i'm not saying this is the end all right uh, because real world evidence is a complement to randomized trials it's not supplementing randomized trials we need to do this a predictable way and equally essential we need to differentiate swiftly and effectively between valid studies and misleading studies this is where everybody's struggling with on the regulatory side, on the HDA side, and uh, we're making good progress there, uh, but it's it's ongoing activity. And I'm really thankful for all the good work that you guys are doing and um, like to collaborate with you. Thank you very much.